No comment about Thank you everyone for coming out on Friday night and no doubt you all had other plans for Marx's birthday, so thank you for being here. Uh, I have uh, talked a lot today already, but I'm, gonna, um, I'm actually going to read a little bit from uh, my book. The book is uh, a series of essays, which I've written over the last five to ten years. Uh, a couple of them were written more recently. Uh, the, S, the, the book was, was really conceived in the context of the, the Long War, which is a, a framework that was put forward by Donald Rumsfeld in 2002 and 2003 after the launching of the Iraq War. Um, and it is an effort as well, I think, and what spurred me to publish the book and to kind of collect the essays together um, to kind of think of the, the present moment, to think of the Trump moment um, as, as, as a moment that really can't really be understood outside of the context of the long war. So in some ways, the book is thinking uh, about the contemporary crisis that is occasioned by the election of Trump. It's thinking of the, the, the more uh, sort of medium-term crisis that has been occasioned by the the radical mutation of our politics occasioned by an era of permanent war. Um, and then it's trying to reach into the deeper past to think about how, um, how this is not necessarily a novel situation, but it's, that it's something that is linked to the long history of the United States. So um, it's become common to speak of the militarization of policing and the blurring of the boundaries between war and police in the United States today. But in the context of the long history of the United States, and particularly uh, the history of its racial politics and its racial formation, policing has arguably never been distinct from a situation that we might describe as civil warfare. So what I'm trying to do in the book is actually to think about how war and police make race or how race and race making becomes a kind of hinge between war, warfare and policing, um, and how what we think of as warfare in the overseas context uh, actually has a manifestation inside the United States and in its history in the way in which um, a kind of racialized policing unfolds in the United States itself. So um, the hallmark of local and state sovereignty in the United States has been, um, has been sort of manifested by the control exerted by white citizens over indigenous and exogenous others, that is, Indians and slaves, through the mechanisms of population transfer, confinement, and death enacted by militias, patrols, overseers, and frontier soldiers. This is the origin of the United States. This is the origin of the United States, uh, not as a nation state, not as a republic um, organized through uh, a kind of unprecedented freedom, but as an empire state in which freedom was uh, an unevenly distributed uh, attribute uh, held on the one hand by citizens and withheld on the other hand by those who were um, either slated for elimination or slated for coerced labor. Um, race management is the terrain in which this unfolds, um, and race management induced what I describe as the ongoing slippage between policing and war that still visibly characterizes the present. The steady expansion of the application of criminal law to acts of indigenous counterviolence and resistance, for example, <coughs> was a primary means of erasing Indian tribal sovereignty that had once been negotiated through warfare and treaty obligations. The slave patrol similarly grew directly from the citizen militia, motivated primarily by fears of slave insurrection, <coughs> developing the legal and narrative means to criminalize the actual and imagined counterviolence of dominated peoples was not only central to the institutionalization and le legitima legitimation of suppressive force, but was also a repression and disavowal of any prior recognition 
that enmity, discord, and trauma issued from the violence of white settlers and enslavers. But beneath any ideological or psychological ruminations lay the practical concern of how to both defend and legitimate a social order built on murder and dispossession, that is the theft of black labor and indigenous lands. So in a sense, what I'm saying here is, is that the United States originates in a crime. Um, and you know, it sounds kind of incendiary maybe to say that or sort of rhetorically excessive, but I think the rationalization of that crime um, and the effort to actually um, displace that crime in some ways away from its actual, uh, its actual origins and its actual history is really kind of central to what we've been reckoning in this country really from its origin. Uh, by the late 17th century, racial differentiation was already defined through graduated policing and punishment that distinguished blacks and Indians from prospective members of civil society. Under Virginia law, blacks and Indians sentenced to whipping were to be stripped of any protective garment, while white Christian servants were allowed to retain the dignity and protection of clothing while being beaten. The fabrication of race through such petty differentiations in the type of violence that could be enacted on the body illuminates what has often been the paucity of white privilege. It has also developed, however, into a more salient distinction between the punished and the punishers. An important mediating institution was the slave patrol, which in the language of the Georgia General Assembly, presumed that, quote, every Negro, Indian, mulatto, and mestizo is a slave. John Caphart, a constable and slave catcher in Norfolk, Virginia in the 1840s, illuminates the distinctive economy of deterrence and prerogative, sadism and reward that governed the fashioning of America's racial order. And this is a quote. It was part of my business to arrest all slaves and free persons of color who were collected in crowds at night and lock them up. I did this without warrant and at my own discretion. Next day they are examined and punished. The punishment is flogging. I am one of the men who flog them. I am paid 50 cents for every Negro I arrest and 50 cents more if I flog him. I have flogged hundreds. I never refuse a good job of that kind. Here, the link between whiteness as a pivot between individual opportunity and national standing, between access to the wage and access to the public mechanisms of legitimate violence, is clearly laid out. Caphart's account also highlights how the racial line constructing civil life developed from the long-standing fear that black social life subverted the body politic. In 1802, the U.S. Postmaster General warned against hiring Negro mail carriers as it might lead to associating, acquiring, and communicating sentiments about their natural rights under the Constitution, thus establishing a chain or line of intelligence and insurrectionary activity dangerous to civic order. The right to bear arms under the Second Amendment on the grounds of a well-regulated militia being necessary to the security of a free state and the defense of the open carrying of weapons was similarly linked to the preservation of local policing prerogatives and Southern honor in the face of black population density and divided national sentiment over slavery. The infamous Dred Scott decision defending the status of slaves as property throughout the nation cemented these associations by connecting the freedom of fugitive slaves with illegality and reinforcing the idea that blacks, in the words of Supreme Court Justice Roger Taney, possessed no rights that whites anywhere were bound to respect. In the words of, the first system, of, in the words of one of the first systematic historians of slavery, an, ap an apologia, the white supremacist historian U.B. Phillips observed that, quote, all white persons were permitted, and in some regards were required, to exercise a police power over slaves. Phillips, of course, erased the course of abolitionist and anti-slavery agitation and underground resistance incited by the Dred Scott decision, which intensified the mid-century crisis over slavery and led eventually to the Civil War. 
Resistance to slave rendition in the 1850s, for example, led the Fugitive Slave Commissioner in Boston to decry abolitionists for levying war on the United States. In truth, resisting slavery was a crime against property that threatened the basis of civic order. Writing two decades before Phillips, John Burgess, another theorist of white supremacy at the turn of the 20th century, was more circumspect, and Burgess like Phillips is a really key American intellectual because Burgess was really the founder of the discipline of political science, much as Phillips was one of the key early founders of the discipline of history. Um, and this is what Burgess said. Burgess said, had the slave owners made wise use of the advantages given to them under the Dred Scott decision, they would have given themselves no further occasion for slavery agitation ceased to claim the rendition of their fugitive slaves by the general government, and instead turned their attention to perfecting the police administration in the slaveholding commonwealths. Here, Burgess recognized that the bulwark of federalism, that is, states' rights, defined by police discretion and jurisdictional autonomy, um, could actually be a, a, a mechanism for maintaining racial order based on holding people as property without needing the ratification of a kind of national sanction. Um, so it is not incidental that the scholarly and public study of police power in the United States emerged in the ascendant period of US white supremacy after the Civil War and Reconstruction. Above all, it pointed out the formless, discretionary, and aggrandizing dimensions of police functions and institutions in a world that appeared to be in rapid racial transition. According to Ernst Freund, the police power is not a fixed quantity, but the expression of social, economic, and political conditions. As long as these conditions vary, the police power must continue to be elastic, that is, capable of development. Attending to the state and local levels of political sovereignty Burgess called the police power the dark continent of our jurisprudence, the convenient repository of everything for which our juristic classifications can find no other place. In 1904, in the name of securing public order beyond the nation's borders, President Theodore Roosevelt, a former New York City police commissioner, arrogated to the United States an expansive international police power to confront chronic wrongdoing or an impetus or an impotence which results in the general loosening of the ties of civilized society. <clears throat> One does not need to read deeply here to notice the elective affinities of policing and race making within a developmental schema that comprised normative visions of public order and the rule of law alongside the preservation and cultivation of exceptions permitting the expanding use of discretionary violence. So, um, so, the, 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 as, so, so there's sort of two points I want to make here, really. That racism, in some ways, is the means by which war became normalized as policing, right? A warfare project that was directed on the frontier and directed against the possibility of civil insurrection um, from slaves. Um, and it's also the means in which police action came to license a kind of warlike relationship. More precisely, we might say that race has been made and renewed in the passage between norm and law, police and war, and the movement of state violent, violence inside and outside its prescribed borders. Policing makes race when it removes normative barriers to police violence. War makes race when it relieves legal barriers to war's limitations. And an example of this in the sort of contemporary moment, in the moment of sort of the passage of our own history that kind of links back to this earlier period, um, we might look at the autobiography published after the LA uprisings in 1992, um, uh, after the four police officers had been taped brutally beating unarmed black motorist Rodney King. And in this autobiography, Daryl Gates, who was the police chief of um, LA at the time, recalls that at the end of the 1960s, without official authorization, he and a few colleagues began reading everything we could get our hands on concerning guerrilla warfare. We watched with interest what was happening in Vietnam. 
we looked at military training, and in particular, we studied what a group of Marines based at the Naval Armory in Chavez Ravine were doing. They shared with us their knowledge of counterinsurgency and guerrilla warfare because, as we recognized, America's streets had become a foreign territory. Now, it's perhaps facile to equate the beat of the slave patrol, and the beat was the name that slave patrollers gave to the routes they traveled um, on, the, on the kind of, in, kind of in, in sort of patrolling the sort of borderlands of slavery. It might be facile to equate this term with the modern patrol officer's beat. But I think the point I want to make here is that there's actually a deep and long-standing connection in the history of American policing that not only links the slave patrol with the modern police patrol, but that actually connects up a certain kind of understanding of the objects of policing as racialized objects. As the former New York City Police Commissioner Raymond Kelly, who was at one point the candidate for the director of the Department of Homeland Security, um, in defending the racially discriminatory policy of stop and frisk, uh, <coughs> argued, he said, we need stop and frisk because it instills fear in the city's criminal element. Encouraged by a statistics-based performance management system, the NYPD conducted a staggering 5 million stops and some 2.5 million frisks between 2002 and 2012. More than 85% of those stopped were black and Latino residents, overwhelmingly men, and only 1.5% of the stops resulted in the discovery of a weapon, and only 6% of all stops resulted in a summons or an arrest. So in a sense, the purpose of the stops and frisks were actually exactly as Raymond Kelly said. It was a project to instill fear. That was part of its purpose. The judge, Shira Scheindlin, who ruled against this policy before she was removed, the case, removed from the case, noted that the racial composition of the precinct or census tract predicts the stop rate above and beyond the crime rate, and that the population stopped and frisked is overwhelmingly innocent. And it's really only when this ruling came down that stop and frisk ended in New York City. But it's a policy that really goes back to kind of Giuliani time in New York. And really, there's been almost 20 years in New York of police terror in black and brown communities that have been sort of, sort of through these, these sort of, um, you know, what, what, what's called broken windows policing, but really through this kind of, these kind of police flying squadrons, which really, whenever they see a black or brown body out of place, um, see, saw the prerogative to basically stop, frisk, pat down, sometimes arrest, sometimes twist an arm, sometimes twist a neck. Um, but, but essentially, this has, been, this has been sort of part of the life of people in New York City for the last two decades. Uh, policing what comes to be noted or anticipated as crime by means ranging from mild correction to justifiable homicide was the essence of slave and frontier law. The long-standing practice of criminalizing blackness in particular helps us to recognize racial distinction as an obscured mode for instituting society that has been retained across changes in formal racial categories and degrees of inclusion. White supremacy, even as its legitimacy has waned, and despite Trump, I still think its legitimacy has waned, gave shape to a form of group differentiated power, pleasure, and social control that accrued value and shaped US institutions over a long period. The racial distribution and directionality of the legitimate violence it has exerted over those regarded as dangerous or inconvenient has publicly confirmed it and performed its most essential work. The majority of Negroes are of a plotting disposition, dark, sullen, malicious, revengeful, and cruel in the highest degree Benjamin Franklin noted toward the end of his life. Um, even though at the time Franklin was already an abolitionist advocating the end of slavery. But despite his abolitionist sympathies, Franklin doubted that mild laws could govern such a people, which is to say he affirmed an existence beyond the civil realm that could only be held in check by coercive means. War shaped the disposition of police power in the early republic. Today, it is common to observe that urban policing is a field of war. These are related propositions. 
Both the recasting of war as policing and the licensing of police to engage in the equivalent of warfare rely on and reproduce the racial construct of an enemy population without substantive rights. In the 1990s, Eric Holder, the first black U.S. Attorney General for the District of Columbia, was instrumental in implementing Operation Ceasefire, a precursor to stop and frisk to combat the drug trade and its associated violence. The scale of violence during this period routinely occasioned comparisons to war. As one policeman observed, this is a jungle. We rewrite the Constitution every day down here. Just over a decade later, during his tenure as President Obama's Attorney General, Holder was called upon to issue an opinion on the use of drones in the global war on terror. Notably, he defended the practice of targeted killing in spite of occasions of collateral victims, often including guests at weddings and funerals, by likening it to the exigencies of the police, who not unreasonably, quote, prevent a suspect's escape by using deadly force. With the arrival of Donald Trump in the White House, the emphasis has returned to the inner war on the border and in the central city. Trump's first executive actions were signals of the power of police discretion in the name of national security. Trump owed his own political rise to a particular kind of racist signaling towards police from the moment when he called for the execution of the Central Park Five uh, in 1989 to his support for stop and frisk during the election campaign. In commenting on Black Lives Matter protests against police violence, Trump's chief strategic advisor, Steve Bannon, invoked the thinking of Benjamin Franklin and countless others who have ascribed antisocial violence to racial differences. Here's a thought, Bannon said. What if the people getting shot by the cops did things to deserve it? There are, after all, in this world, some people who are, quote, naturally aggressive and violent. Bannon and Trump have similarly defined immigration policy as falling within the ambit of war, with a reassertion of the possibility of national origins restrictions and the widening of criminal suspicion and administrative prerogatives attached to racial alienage. These are not Jeffersonian Democrats, Bannon remarked in 2016, referring to immigrants from Muslim-majority countries to the United States and Europe. These are not people with thousands of years of democracy in their DNA coming up here. The arc of settler freedom here once again bends along a racial border. In the contemporary United States, criminal assignment and anticipatory criminalization licenses ever-widening practices of discrimination in which the situational debilities and material debts that sometimes lead to unlawful acts against persons and properties become the fixed property of persons. An astonishing 11 million arrests were recorded in the United States in 2015, in a period that has been marked by a decline in crime rates. A felony conviction imposes durable civil liability, blocking access to free movement, employment, education, housing, and in many cases the franchise, even for those who have completed prison sentences. Since the 1990s, the size of the Border Patrol and Immigration and Customs Enforcement uh, has quadrupled. They now detain more than 400,000 people per year, operating a system of capture and mass removal that continues to expand the carceral state. Criminality is a name given to a type of violence that threatens the social and civic order. Policing is the institution that keeps such violence in check. This often appears to be a normalized and unproblematic claim. Yet this presumed normalcy partakes of a shadow lineage in which human incommensurabilities become the means of licensing and retroactively justifying extraordinary violence and coercion. Beginning after World War II, overseas war in nominally sovereign post-colonial nations was routinely described as police action, while US domestic policing was increasingly invested with the ontological urgency and moral equivalence of war. Certain perceived somatic and allegedly genetic features have long been linked with moral, aesthetic, spiritual, and intellectual defects that fix a person's place in social hierarchy. Over several decades, anti-racist and anti-colonial struggles brought naturalized racial stigma under stricter public scrutiny and criticism, and even into disrepute. 
However, in verse to these successes, the expansion of policing and criminal punishment maintained, restored, and expanded the ambit of debilities and penalties that were established long ago at the, at the nexus of race and war. So that's the end of what I'm going to read. I hope that was somewhat intelligible to you as listeners. So um, I realized actually as I was reading it, and I kind of wanted to de deviate from my text, but I wasn't really prepared to do so. Um, having had a couple of drinks before this myself. Um, <laughs> So I'm happy to talk about it. You know, I think, I think it's not, when I was reading it, I was kind of aware that it's not the easiest thing to kind of hear, maybe, and follow in the texture of the argument. But really what I'm trying to do is, is to kind of think about how, how we, we live in a society that has always been confused about its boundaries. It's been confused about its borders, and it's been confused about um, the nature of its, uh, of its membership. Um, and and the, 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 the sort of formative experiences of, of, of expansion and enslavement and, the, and the, the, the fears of insurrection, particularly, that, that developed around enslavement, um, and the fears of a kind of violence from without that developed from the, front, the expansion of the frontier in the Indian Wars and the continued kind of hunger for Indian lands, actually produced... Um, both kind of psychic and effective dispositions, but also institutions around policing um, that, that have actually shaped American society for a very, very long period of time. And that uh, we still live with those institutions, we still live with those affects and dispositions, and they're still organized through the nexus of kind of race um, understood both as a kind, of, a kind of external enemy and as an internal enemy. Um, and, and that's a reciprocal sort of almost like, it almost operates on a sort of a feedback loop. So if the Bush administration seemingly was a Republican administration that was kind of, kind of racially inclusive, right? And this was a moment where the GOP was trying to be a big tent and sort of prove itself to be non, kind of a non-racist party. Um, they also launched a war on terror, which was sort of predicated upon the idea of a racial enemy. And one of the primary mechanisms for sort of proving that there was a racial enemy was proving that there were people who were torturable, you know, people who actually deserved this kind of, um, this kind of sanctioned sadism that came from the, uh, the sort of the highest pinnacles of kind of American state rationality. Um, and sort of now we sort of, the sort of arc of that to be bends towards Trump, where, where Trump kind of um, sort of imagines a kind of a withdrawal from the world to some degree. Um, and the focus now is on a kind of a savagery that sort of threatens us from within. You know, and, 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 and so under Trump, we see the kind, of, the kind of other side of the inner war, right? I mean, the other side of the sort of race war or war policing nexus in which um, the, the, there's a kind of, um, there's a, kind of a, a proliferation of a kind of imaginary around enemies that are besieging us on all sides. Um, and that leads to a sort of a sense that, that we need to kind of license our police and border agents to have ever more discretion over who they can capture and remove. So, so between Trump and, and Bush, of course, we have Obama, you know, and Obama is a kind of a complex figure in some ways in my account, because I think Obama represents a moment in which there's a sort of a desire to restore a kind of a normative sense of, of the United States as a country that is committed to um, a kind of a racially inclusive project on a <laughs> national scale, right? Um, but that at the same time remains a kind of a kind of re reluctant empire. And of course, what Obama did was to remove deportation into the shadows, to kind of lower the volume of the war on terror, to, 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 to end the practices of torture in a kind of public way, but to in some, in some way also kind of continue and sort of perpetuate the institutional machineries that had been kind of inaugurated under Bush. And sort of part of my argument really is that the, the sort of, the effort to kind of, and it's more evident now that we have Trump in the White House, but I think when I started writing this um, during the Obama years, one of the things I was struggling with was the claim that, 
you know, we were now a kind of a post-racial society, right? How could anybody argue that the United States was sort of riven with this sort of historic and kind of deep-lying racial animus if we had a black president who sort of presented himself as someone who was the fulfillment of our better history, our history of inclusion, our history of diversity, our history of civil rights, and so on and so forth. But, but the, 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 the thing that I, I, I sort of argued then the thing that I argue in the book is that part of what, what, what sort of maintains the kind of logic of American racialism, uh, racialization, is this traffic between the inner and the outer war, right? It's actually never just, it's never just happening in one place. It's actually happening in sort of, in sort of both places. Um, and and the, 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 the desire to sort of disavow that is sort of part of the mechanism that we have to kind of kind of grapple with. So anyway, I've, I've probably gone on for too long now, so, so let me see if there's anyone who wants to jump in. And, yeah, I was wondering as you were speaking, is it about, is it about, is it about the, uh, the, the economic pie that, 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 it, that, that it's hard to share because there's too many people, or is it, is it race? Is, is, it, is it because, is it, is it a, su a superiority thing? Because you're, you know, they, you know, you, the the existing uh, the white America feels like they're better than than the rest of us, or I, I don't know, is it economics? Is it? I don't know what it is. It seems like it's a lot of things. But I'm trying to figure out as you're speaking, what you know, what's the purpose of the, the separation? Okay, let me take a couple of questions and sort of see if I can circle back around and, and sort of answer all of them. Uh, yes. My question is, I, I have for quite a long time wondered about the, uh, the definition, the reality of race. I can't, um, I simply can't somehow, uh, given, I don't know, genetics, whatever, there is no black, white, brown, whatever. These are, these are constructs. Mm -hmm. They're constructs. Mm -hmm. They have no reality in terms of our actual physiological development. Uh, that's what disturbs me most, that there seems not to be any sort of people kind of saying, wait a minute, look at science, look at, no, and I know, I know um, science and everything in this, in the Trump, okay, I don't want to even get into this, but just the fact that there is no, so far as, what I want to know is how do we justify or explain or define race? I just don't get it. Great, great. Okay, I'll take this. I'll take all of them and then, and then <laughs> see if I can do all of them. Okay, um, yeah. Influence on policing and war. When you think about our endless wandering east, 
of space, spatialization um, in algorithmic policing um, and play a part in, in this picture of um, internal and external war um, and how it has to do with, because there's a lot of people talking about carceral capitalism, race, racial capitalism, moving toward um, like non-racialized euphemisms for mm. race, yeah. like neighborhood. And yeah. So, yeah, Okay, well, I'll take one more, and I think I can keep all of them in my head. <laughs> okay, so I, I, uh, I'm really sympathetic to that point that you made about the Los Angeles Police Department. Uh, Mike Davis has a famous essay where uh, he quotes from one of their press conferences, and they say that uh, rounding up everyone tonight, meaning basically Compton and North Long Beach, uh, was the equivalent of Vietnam here. Yeah, Vietnam. that's right. Yeah, yeah. So that's like the famous thing in City of Quartz. Right. Uh, but uh, I guess, I, I mean, it might be in the book, appeal, so I, I'm going to get a copy. But I was just kind of curious about this idea of the inner, inner and out, outer war. And it would seem to me to be uh, like something you'd have to periodize a little, or in my own mind, I periodize it quite substantially, so in the sense that um, after the Second World War, you know, like there's this Perry Anderson book, uh, American Foreign Policy and Its Thinkers, mm -hmm. and there's this just huge expansion after the Second World War of the global empire. Right. And then there's uh, all these CIA interventions and, you know, this new kind of dimension of things. So, uh, you know, just... Uh, at, at earlier points, too, even, you could say, uh, you know, like with the, the great realm of the Monroe Doctrine and the control, there, there seems to be a kind of creative and semi-autonomous dimension of foreign policy uh, from the internal war and population control. So I see the interrelationship, but I also just... You see what I'm getting at? I do, I do, I do. I see exactly what you're getting at. Yeah, yeah, okay. Yeah, yeah. Okay. okay. <laughs> so, yeah. Thank you. That, those, are, those are great questions. And they're, I mean, they're really on point. So it makes me at least think that I'm doing something half right by, like, you know, inspiring the right questions. I mean, is it, is it, is it race or economy? Right. I mean, this is, or, or is it, you know? I think, I, I think, how, what does economy have to do with the logic that I'm talking about? Right. I mean, I think that's part of the question here. Um, how do we understand what race is when it has no basis in uh, kind of kind of human biological differentiation? That it's a kind of a, it's a construct. Yes. Um, how do we think about um, the the sort of expansion of sort of non non racial reference for race, you know, or for race making. Um, uh, how do we think about periodizing these kinds of modalities, right, through the sort of the sort of the long durée? And what I did, what I kind of gave you was the sort of the sort of beginning and the end in some ways. And I think. I, I don't want to sort of mislead with the idea that I'm sort of arguing for some kind of some kind of continuous history here, um, but I think what I do want to say, in part, is is that to understand what race is, we have to understand something about the the institution of policing, right? and that the institution of policing itself is is partly attaining its flexibility. In our, in our mode of capitalism, right, as something that can be both can be directed both in, internally and externally, right. So in some sense, the United States is a is a history of permanent war or permanent counterinsurgency in defense of the accumulation of capitalist property relation, you know, capitalist property, right. So. So there's a certain kind of way in which the history of the United States, you can see something about the, the permanence of that counterinsurgency, in part because 
of the ways in which it never really stabilized along any kind of specific axis. It was internally directed because this was a slave owning and settler society for its first century. And then it was externally directed in the context of its expansionist projects, which are, are also continuous. I mean, they're, 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 they're sort of three arcs, right? There's the arc of, 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 kind of, of kind of continental expansion, there's the arc of overseas expansion, and then there's the arc of global empire. Right? So, so we can we can sort of we can we can see how the United States, as a as an empire state and not a nation state, has kind of navigated this sort of duality from its beginning, a duality that has been based upon the idea of a kind of democratic citizenry and superimposed upon um, a series of different kinds of others, who are um, managed through. Uh, institutions of coercive force. And those institutions of coercive force, whether they are defined primarily as a kind of a militarized vector outwardly directed towards expulsion or elimination, or internally directed towards sequestration and confinement, right, operate on a kind of continuum. They operate on a continuum institutionally in terms of the personnel and the transfer between these different institutions. And they operate on a continuum ideologically because they're about the production of certain kinds of racialized enemies. I don't think we can understand what race means unless we understand it in relationship to these very specific kind of institutionalized histories of coercive violence. So one of the definitions for what race is or what racism is comes from the the, the African-American scholar of American prisons, Ruth Wilson Gilmore, who says race is the state-sanctioned, group-differentiated production of premature death. Thank you very All right? much. So the state-sanctioned, group-differentiated production of premature death. So, so there's something about the project by which the state, and this makes me think of Assad's paper that he gave earlier today, when we think of Marxism, like what Marxism is, and it really dawned on me from your paper, you know, we think of Marxism as being about the end of capitalism, but Marxism is actually also about the end of the state, right? Like, like our communism, or, the, or, or, or sort of the revolutionary vision of Marx. And, and sort of in a sense, when we're talking about capitalism and the state, we're actually talking about two things that have always operated in a kind of in a kind of imbricated relationship, right? And then there's a certain kind of Marxism that wants to imagine you can talk about capitalism without talking about the state. And there's a certain kind of political theory that wants to imagine you can talk about the state and government without talking about capitalism. But these are actually conjoined projects. And one of the places where race operates, race operates at the, at the join. It operates at the join both of a kind of accumulation process but also at the join of the kind of development of certain kinds of coercive mechanisms that can, um, that can manage populations in their differentiation, right? Both their class differentiation and their racial differentiation. It's functional to the project of capital accumulation, but it's also directly value producing, right? And that's what we talked about a little bit earlier today. So in terms of this kind of notion of policing and criminalization, I think I find this really, really interesting and important because in a way, right, you go back all the way to the, the 13th Amendment where you have the abolition of slavery except in the case of the punishment of crime, right? And so it's, this, it's kind of this interesting moment and it's not simply the case that um, you could sort of re-enslave people, although there was convict leasing and sort of various kinds of uh, modalities in which you had slavery by another name after the abolition of slavery, right? So, so that is important. But I think more important is the kind of symbolic marking of the way in which criminalization took up the ambit of a kind of racializing project. So in a certain kind of way, you can trace color blindness all the way back to that moment where you basically sort of say, we don't actually need to say that this is about black people. This is about people who are criminals, right? This, this is about people who are now somehow sort of, sort of defined in a certain kind of way as people who can be objects of state violence. Of course, race and criminality are being tightly, tightly bound together in a kind of, in a kind of chain of associations, 
um, and statistical and algorithmic calculations, really, really going back all the way back to the, to the turn of the century. And if you read like Khalil Muhammad's work on the origins of crime statistics, you know, you really find these in the, in the very late 19th century as, as a, kind of, a kind of a mode of knowledge production. So I think we're actually, again, dealing with something that has a long, you know, a long history and, and a history that has sort of built into itself this kind of, uh, this kind of deniability that it actually is somehow um, illegitimate to ascribe characteristics to certain people based upon their, their, sort of, their sort of irredeemable character. It's really about what they do, and what they do is, is sort of um, something that we have to control because it threatens the sort of the basis of our kind of, our kind of civil relationships. So finally, and then I'll let you know anyone who wants to jump in. Um, I'm just trying to sort of do, do my best to cover the terrain. I think you know the the mutation of of the sort of of the of the sort of the, uh, Philip made this point last night, which I think was right. That that in a certain kind of way, um, that that we have been dealing with the transformation of, of the of the sort of the global empire and its involution since the Vietnam War, since the end of the Vietnam War. I think the end of the Vietnam War really is the period in which you begin to see, and I mean this is, this is sort of historically well known now, really the origins of the carceral state. So if we think of the carceral state as one of the great state-making projects of the last 50 years, a massive investment right, in state machineries, in tax resources, in, the, in, in, in kind of bond initiatives, in infrastructure construction, in, um, in population transfer, you know, that's involved millions of people it, sort of being drawn up into it. I mean, we, we have a periodization, we have a historical account of this, right? And it really goes back to the, the, the sort of, the, the decisions that are being made in the post-riot period of, of the kind of late 1960s, you know, and the, the decision to sort of begin to invest federal money in the construction an investment in a in a in a massively enlarged and massively um, sort of invested in kind of policing complex, and that has just grown steadily and continuously since the 1970s. You know, it really is one of the great. Again, like you think of it as a state making project and as a race making project. You know, and I think I think when we think of it in those terms as occurring right at the moment where you have formal equality on racial terms, only established in the United States in 1965 with civil rights and voting rights. And now, a new assemblage of kind of, of, kind of capture and control and the diversion of safe state resources towards basically um, policing poor communities of color, you know, and, and sort of cycling them through this this kind of this kind of machinery, and of course, it's now also augmented by the by the board, by the border, by the criminalization of border violations, right? Which comes uh, in the 1990s, really, in the Clinton years, where you begin to sort of have um, the kind of violations associated with immigration criminalized and sort of then subject again to the same kind of machinery. Um, all of that just sort of sort of grows and grows on itself. You know, and I think this is this is an this is a warfare project. You know, this is the sort of replacement of the welfare warfare state that's focused on the rest of the world with a kind of it's kind of as I say it's kind of involution. And it's not that the the outer war doesn't doesn't reemerge, but remember, you know, there was a problem of the outer war after Vietnam. You know, the the, the first Gulf War was very short lived. You know, and George H.W. Bush said, we've kicked the Vietnam syndrome, look, we can do this, we can do big war again. But the truth is they couldn't do big war again. And then they tried again in 2003. They were, they were like, okay, now we really can do big war. But even in 2003, nobody bought it. Nobody bought the big outer war. Of course, we have a big outer war. We have a, now we have a big outer war and a big inner war. But the big outer war is something we sort of, I think, mostly just kind of think of as, as something that happens off screen, right? It's just, it's just kind of over there. I think the real story in some ways has been the story of what's been going on internally for a long time, you know? And I think it's not an accident 
that you, that you then really see the mechanisms of torture uh, and confinement and all of these things that we saw erupt in Iraq, these were all things that have already been going, been going on inside the carceral state for many, many years, even before they were exposed in Abu Ghraib and other places. And this is not to say that one is more important or less important than the other. It's just to actually highlight the point I've been making about this kind of reciprocity, this kind of continuum. Um, and we have to dismantle the, 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 the military carceral state. You know, that is a big part of the project of what we have to do. Thank you. Um, and that, that seems to me to be real, I mean, that's the, the kind of animating sort of, sort of impetus behind writing this book. And in different kinds of ways, I'm trying to address that question. Um, and it's not an answer to the problem of capitalism in toto, because I do see these as, as very much related to the crisis of capitalism. Um, in, 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 in American life and in, in, in sort of the global moment that we're in. But it actually does seem to me to be something that we have the potential to have a real popular movement behind. You know, I think, I think, it, I think we, have, you know, we had 36 million people march against the Iraq war in 2003. It's hard to remember that, right? I mean, to me, this is really the beginning of Trumpism. Right? It's the beginning of the kind of, the kind of circus of our politics. You know, and, and Obama was supposed to be a kind of corrective. Uh, but the corrective never really happened. It never really took. Right? Uh, and so anyway, I'm, I'm now, I'm, now I'm rambling and I've talked for too long. So I'm sure there's more, more things to say. You know, I think that's an astonishing image to think of it as uh, a, a monstrous essay. Creation of nation building, state building, the carceral state. I never thought of it that way. But it almost becomes this insane inverse image of the New Deal on that kind That's of right. scale. That's right. You know, all the stuff that could have been put, you know, you hear things like, well, they built lots of prisons in California, but they're not building any new education institutions, which of course hints at the idea. But when you claim that in fact it is a kind of total state making project that even might dwarf the New Deal in its scale, the monstrous inutility of it becomes more manifest to think that yeah. this is where the energies of the nation were pushed for various reasons. I mean, and there's a big struggle here in King County around the building of this youth jail, you know, and I think everybody should be informing themselves about that if you're not already informed about that. I'm not here to tell you about it because I know less about it than many of you, I'm sure, know about it. But, it, but it, it's, it's directly relevant to this, this question. This sort of strikes me. Um, I grew up in a uh, very small mining town, actually, and uh, very, very isolated from any other city. And uh, when, I, when I was a kid, the thing that came in was a maximum security prison. Yeah. And this completely stabilized the economy. Like, it had been up and down, and people talked about, oh my gosh, like the union strike fund, all this type of stuff. It completely stabilized the economy, and also, at the same time, destroyed the prison, or destroyed the, the mining union. Yeah, exactly. Because it's, it's, it's there, and it's just, it really, it really strikes me yeah. as, how, as how this does, like as Philip said, sort of, sort of like a kind of new deal. And, and it just sort of cements that politics in place, because now, I mean, growing up, I had a lot of, like, I mean, my, my family never worked directly to the prison, but, like, we benefited from it. And that provided me with a lot of the opportunities that I've had. And that just sort of, sort of for me, helps realize how, like, cemented this is in the fabric of, of this country. No, I think it's a, good, it's a good point. I do a lot of work with, in, a, in a, a prison in upstate New York, and most of the men in this prison, it's a men's prison, are... are are from New York City. Most of them are, are African American, Latino, and they they call it a plantation, you know. And prison guarding has now in this town become a, a kind of intergenerational job. So your dad was a prison, and they're all white, most of them, not all of them. But your dad was a prison guard. Maybe now soon it will be your granddad was a prison guard. You know, and it's it's this very perverse, and it's not like that everywhere, but in a lot of rural sort of um, abandoned areas. Uh, where there once were industrial jobs of, 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 of one kind or another, agricultural jobs of one kind or another, um, prisons have been cited, you know, and, I, and they're building a huge, big federal prison, they're planning to build a huge, big federal prison in Appalachia. <coughs> you know, this is 
this is this is this has been greenlit by the Trump administration, even though everybody in the sort of federal prisons apparatus says there is no need for another federal prison. So it's just it's just to the point. But I do think again, and maybe this goes to the white suprem waning white supremacy question, which I don't think I really got to. I really do think that that, that more and more people see the sort of the sort, not only the waning utility, but the ra irrationality of this kind of this kind of policy, right? Um, and I and I do think, you know, and this maybe goes back to sort of a more positive meaning of like what the Obama presidency was. And I, I, I think I, I say this, and maybe people are going to think I'm, I'm I'm foolish for saying it, but I really do think that. Um, you know that, and I said this last night that one of the things that really scared the right uh, about Obama was the sort of the idea that um, there would be a, actually a, 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 a mobilized, expanded electorate that really reflected the, the sort of um, the sort of the broad range of the American polity. Right? That I think that I think that we are in a period of like a kind of a of a kind of, a, a, almost a kind of a last gasp of a sort of a white supremacist politics in this country. And that's not to say that it's not built upon a long-standing edifice, right? And it's also not to say that, 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 the, that, that, that the, the non, the sort of, the non-racial, the non-explicitly racial codifications of racial differentiation aren't going to kind of continue within the framework of a certain kind of neoliberal Capitalism, right? So, so it's 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 not an argument that by saying that I mean in a certain way what 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 I'm saying is is that the form of white supremacy is not necessarily the form of kind of kind of the future of of American racism, possibly, right? Um, and so so there's a there's a there's a way in which. Um, we have a kind of opportunity right now. Like we have, as, as much as we, as much as it sometimes feels like this is the sort of moment in which there's been a, a kind of a resurgence of something that is, that is, that is sort of omnipresent and kind of a heavy weight. In another way, it's like this, this stuff can be, this stuff can actually be um, beaten. Like I think it can really be beaten. Um, now I feel like I'm, I'm, I'm losing like my own conviction as I'm saying that. <laughs> but um, so, so, so perhaps I should stop the last time. Well, um, you talked about counterinsurgency, but I'm interested in hearing you talk about insurgency. Yeah. And you know, your yeah. first book is about the civil rights movement, and I think you show that the arc of the civil rights movement was not to be realized in the vision of Obama and inclusion, but it was an insurgency. Yeah. And the extent to which white supremacy now uh, cannot uh, assume its legitimacy is due to the depth, to, to the radical depth of the civil rights insurgency. That's right. That's right. And that's something that's right. that you have really illuminated. Yeah. I thank you for saying that. Um, and I and I and I think actually you you point to something that I feel like was a real struggle for me, and remains a kind of struggle for me because I I sort of now I've written so I've written these like two books and like one is kind of about insurgence the long insurgency of the Black Freedom Movement and the other is kind of about the long counterinsurgency, you know and in a certain way I think you know Obama to me is the is 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 the sort of embodiment really of the of the counterinsurgency. Much more than Trump, because this sort of, this is kind of what I mean about the weakness of white supremacy. I mean the ways in which Trump's kind of mobilizing a lot around white supremacy is actually not as effective as the sort of kind of counterinsurgency that models itself as as sort of protective and inclusive and in the interests of growth and in the interests of order. Right? He's much more about friend enemy politics. I actually feel like we can beat Trump on the grounds of friend enemy. politics. I actually think there are way more of us than there are of them. Even way more people voted for Trump than not for Trump. And the people who didn't vote, I truly don't believe, are the people who are like, you know, not, you know, you know, are kind of out there waiting to be activated by by this kind of reactionary politics. It's too stupid. You know, it really is too stupid. Um, I, I really truly do believe that. Um, but 
but yeah, where is the where is the insurgency kind of the insurgency will have to come? I think from um, f for me, I think a real a real engagement actually with 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 this history that comes out of the struggles against slavery, the struggles against colonialism in the United States, as connected to the struggles for you know the dignity of all labor, right and and I think that, that the resurgence of the left in this moment, in the sort of, in the sort of maybe the, the figure of Sanders and people to the left of Sanders is extremely hopeful, but it will, not, it will not be able to win unless it can really assemble itself in this kind of broader insurgent understanding of the kind of foundational exclusions of the American democratic order. And that's one of the things that sometimes worries me about a certain version of, of the American left that's being revived in this moment under the mantle of a kind of a kind of social democratic um, sort of New Deal nostalgia, because the New Deal itself was sort of sort of organized in that with those kinds of exclusions at its heart, and the civil rights insurgency was precisely about stretching at the limits of that politics, right? And the 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 failure to breach the limits of that politics was not about the failure of the civil rights movement. It was about the counter-revolution, right? And the counter-revolution that was successful in the aftermath of the 1960s. Uh, but I think we actually have the possibility now of taking up that struggle again in a way where more and more people see its possibilities. And like one of the great people out there talking about this right now is William Barber, you know, in the kind of new poor people's campaign and the notion of a third reconstruction, um, you know, you should follow follow Barber. I mean, he's a he's he's from that kind of that kind of the religious side of the civil rights tradition, the radical side of the the the, the civil rights tradition that, that sort of operated through the black church. Um, but he's really kind of talking about these things in a really interesting way, and because because I think he's going back to these different kinds of moments of counter-revolution, right? The post-Reconstruction period was a period of counter-revolution. The period after the Civil Rights Movement was a period of counter-revolution. Um, and, 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 and we're coming out of that, I do. I really do believe we're coming out of that. Um, it doesn't mean that they're not huge kind of perils and, and kind, of, um, kind of pitfalls and dangers in our, in our, you know, in our, uh, in our path, right? Um, but, but I do believe we're coming out. So maybe we should stop there. What do you think? Thank you very much.